Good evening in, in Mexico. My name is Alonso Martin. I recently arrived in Indonesia, appointed as uh, Deputy Chief of Mission. Uh, I will be your moderator today, as I was telling you. I would like to start this seminar session by welcoming you all, excellencies, scholars, colleagues, uh, students from both sides of the ocean. Uh, also, I would like to thank the University of Colima and the University Gadjamada for making this dialogue possible. Uh, Mexico and Indonesia are strategic partners. Furthermore, as the title of the short film recently presented by the Ministry of Culture of Indonesia and the Mexican Foundation, Jorge Marin suggests, both nations are cosmic twins. That means we share a common destiny as our societies and cultures are intertwined at the crossroads of multiculturalism and diversity. This dialogue consists of an open exercise that brings together government and academia to promote mutual knowledge between students from both nations and imagine further actions of academic and cultural exchange. At the end of the presentation, we will have a short Q&A session by the students of, of both universities. For that purpose, please write short and direct questions in the chat window of this platform. I would like to start opening the floor by giving voice to His Excellency Chepi Huartono, but allow me first to briefly introduce him. He has a master's degree in business administration from the European University in Antwerp, Belgium, and a bachelor's degree on economy at the Open University in Indonesia. During his professional career, he's been quite active on public and private sector, a CEO and managing director from various corporations. He was also a member of the House of Representatives, he in Indonesia. He has been also active in sports business under the Ministry of Sports and the CEO of Ice Soccer. Since 2019, he is ambassador of Indonesia to Mexico, accredited also to Guatemala, El Salvador, and Belize. His presentation is titled Indonesia and Mexico, Long Friendship, Strong Relations. Please, Ambassador, you have 10 minutes. Good morning in Indonesia. Good evening in Mexico, Good, everyone. It is nice to be here to greet all of you. I hope everyone is at it is best Condition, condition during pandemic. The pandemic give impact to all aspects of life. However, because of pandemic, we can meet today overcoming the long distance that are common barriers between Indonesia and Mexico. When we are discussing about the relations between Indonesia and Mexico, the diplomatic relations has been started since 1953, which is eight years after Indonesian Independence Day. Since then, both countries maintain their long friendship and try to improve their strong relations. As one proof of the close relationship between Indonesia and Mexico, we can find in Mexico three schools under the name Indonesian school and vice versa in Indonesia. There is Scola Mexico. Throughout the years, Indonesia and Mexico have continuously committed to achieve their development agendas and have successfully attained fundamentally fundamental transformation in all aspects of their government and people. For the betterment of the people of both countries, Indonesia and Mexico have been active in various fora. Together, the two countries have emerged towards becoming part of the global power. Regionally, both countries are active players in FIALAC, APEC, G20, and others. Indonesia and Mexico are also 
the two co-founders of MICTA at the multilateral scenes. Both countries have been sharing common position and supporting each other in many candidacies of international organizations. Ladies and gentlemen, sharing the democratic values and similarities in, the, in diversity of people, resources, and cultures make the relationship between Indonesia and Mexico stronger. The stable and growing Indonesia is good for the world, good for the region, good for Mexico, for Indonesia. Mexico is a gateway to Latin America that offers the opportunity for a market with high growth in the industrial, infrastructures, logistic, connectivity throughout the region. Friendships, ties, and cooperation with other countries are one of key components in Indonesia development strategy. Hence, to Indonesia, undoubtedly, Mexico is more than just a friend. The harmonious relation with Mexico has been and will always be in very good shape and more defined in every aspect. For years now, through the collaboration in different scenes, the two countries' ties have been developing satisfactorily in all aspects. We have established various cooperations between two countries in the field of politics, economic, social cultures, as well as, as education. I fervently believe that the relations of the two countries will continue to advance and stand, but we still have a lot of work to do. We still have an ample room to take our relations to a higher place. Identifying the possibility of collaboration among university in Indonesia and Mexico will contribute to the strong relations of both countries. Finally, hence I welcome to ideas to explore the ASEAN studies in Mexico, especially Indonesia studies, as well as Indonesian academic visions of Mexico and Latin America. Through this cooperation, I hope people to people contact between Mexico, Mexican and Indonesian people will be increased. Indeed, the cooperation between universities in Mexico and Indonesia can enhance the bilateral relations of both countries. Finally, in closing my remarks, allow me to congratulate Mexican people for the 211 year anniversary of Mexico independence celebration. May the people of Mexico always be blessed with happiness, health, and prosperity. The Indonesian Embassy in Mexico City also participate in the celebration of 211 anniversary of Mexico independence through an Indonesian cultural performance in Chiapas on 26th of September 2021. And hopefully relations between Indonesia and Mexico will always grow and improve in the future. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Terima kasih. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, allow me now to introduce Professor uh, Maricela Reyes Lopez. She is a PhD in Southeast Asian Studies from El Colegio de México with a dissertation, Rural Poverty in the Mekong Delta Region of Vietnam. She participated in a stance research at Mekong Delta Development Research Institute, Kantho University, Vietnam, and Phnom Penh in Cambodia. She was an intern at the Thai Embassy to conduct field research in rural areas of that country. She also obtained an, an, obtained an MBA from the University of Colima School of Economic with the dissertation, Social Impact from the Financial Crisis in Asia, Unemployment and Poverty in Indonesia. Since 2009, she teaches at the School of Economic and and School of Political and Social Sciences of the University of Colima. 
As a researcher, she works at the University Center for Studies and Research on the Pacific Basin. Her research topics are contemporary history of South Southeast Asia, rural poverty and regionalism, and the association of Southeast Asian nations, and rural microcredit in Southeast Asia. This occasion, she will speak about Asian studies in Mexico. Professor, you have 10 minutes, please. Thank you very much. I, I want to share with you uh, my presentation. Thank you, thank you for uh, this opportunity, uh, Mr. Ambassador Chepi Huertono, Mr. Ambassador Armando Alvarez, and uh, the uh, scholars, Ms. Lisa Seves and um, Josodo Curcoro, uh, the head of ITPC in Mexico. Of course, thank you very much for uh, your presence. Mexican and Indonesian uh, students. Well, uh, I want to talk about uh, what is important of uh, the studies of uh, Asian studies in Mexico. First, uh, the Southeast Asia require further study in our countries to have the tools that can improve the development of our economies. Uh, 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 Mr. Chepi says, uh, that the uh, importance of the emerging economies uh, as we uh, have in Indonesia and in, in uh, Mexico, and both are regional leaders too. But uh, what background do we have? Uh, you said, uh, thank you for 68 years of the relations between uh, within uh, the two countries. But uh, Indonesia and Mexico can benefit with more cooperation. There are benefits because they have mutual interest, uh, interest in tourism, in investment, in business, in renewable energy, uh, maybe in uh, several areas. So, uh, what do we count to uh, strengthen our, our bilateral relations? Look at this, man, uh, at this map first. Uh, we don't see any obstacle. Uh, there is no uh, walls. So this is a significant idea of what Indonesia and Mexico can work together to uh, uh, strengthen our relations. Uh, we have bilateral instruments uh, such as the, these examples. And these instruments are part of our good relations. But we must reflect on, have we really taken advantage of them? Maybe the immediate answer is not as we want, but we can work together. For example, uh, we have an agreement, an agreement on air transportation services, but we do not have direct air routes that facilitate the promotion of trade, uh, the mobility of tourists, uh, business people, or students. Even the borders that are still uh, closed because of the COVID-19, given us the opportunities to prepare the conditions in which the mobility of people can move directly. We should create strategies to motivate people visit our countries, and not only from Indonesia and Mexico, but from Southeast Asia and Latin America. Another example is uh, the climate change topic. Indonesia and Mexico suffer for, from forest fires every year that destroy the nutrients of the soils, but worse, of course, they destroy human life, fauna and flora. Uh, do you remember the next, uh, uh, last year, we suffered in Mexico for this kind of forest fires, uh, even in Colima too. It's important to create a bilateral technical cooperation links and propose a global strategy. It is important to exchange technical information to recommend our experience for public policies that could be adapted by both governments. Why not? Uh, in short, to strengthen the cooperation of the mutual interest is uh, feasible. But uh, how can we move forward? Well, of course, first, 
by the studying or by researching the different realities and to find the best way to carry out an approach in the mentioned areas and more, more areas too. The students are the future professional human resources who represents the support for development of our countries. And uh, my topic is about uh, what happened in the studies in Mexico. And I want to share with you uh, a, little, a little experience of the uh, studies, Asian studies in, in Colima. In the 90s, there were few educational institutions in Mexico with a specialized graduate studies in Asia. They are public or private institutions in Mexico City. Some offers one year specialization course uh, or master's or doctoral degree. El Colegio de México, the University of Guadalajara are examples. In other states, uh, Jalisco, Baja California and Nayarit, for example, few educational institutions were centered on Asian studies. At the beginning of the new century, the Asian studies began to spread more in our country. But in the same 90s, the University of Colima designed a postgraduate program oriented to the story of the Asia Pacific region, a region that was already seen as the most dynamic in the world economy, economically speaking. It must be added that the state of Colima is recognized for its strategic position and for its, uh, its intense dynamic commercial activity carried out through the port of Manzanillo. Of course, uh, another kind of ports in Indonesia, the Jakarta port, the Tanjung Priok, Surabaya, maybe you have more, more uh, important ports than us, but are important all of them. In these 14 years as a doctorate in Trans-Pacific Relations, but for more than 25 years as a postgraduate postgraduate program, this doctorate has trained human resources and researchers specializing in comparative studies of Mexico with countries in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, one of the features that distinguish the doctorate is um, uh, has been thought in those 25 years with the distant education model and now a semi-virtual model. Another feature is that it is uh, direct because it can be studied after graduation level. And another is uh, this uh, doctorate uh, is uh, the studies of the basis trans-Pacific approach. It is important because if we see again our map, um, we don't have uh, 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 obstacles and Colima uh, should look more to the Pacific and not only see to the North. Uh, to continue strengthening the doctorate in Trans-Pacific relations, there are close ties with agencies and organizations uh, such as the University Center for Studies and Research on the Pacific Basin, uh, the APEC Studies Center of uh, University of Colima, as well with the Mexican Consortium of APEC Studies Center, and of course with some embassies among other institutions and organization. Likewise, at the other graduate uh, in the undergraduate level in different uh, schools, here, subjects and approaches in Asia Pacific and in Southeast Asia have been integrated into the study plan. For example, in the careers of international business, um, in uh, uh, economics and international relations, international commerce too. And I would like here to refer mainly to the audience of Indonesian and Mexican students because you are the ones who will be able to do the relevant studies to learn the languages, Spanish and Bahasa Indonesia, uh, to travel to Indonesia, to travel to Mexico, to know how to do business, how to understand public policies, uh, study the role of the two countries in the international regional organization, Mr. Ambassador mentioned, this is part of the current agenda of the internationalization of the University of Colima. 
let me show you uh, another another kind of things. Uh, students are studying now uh, in in our uh, faculties in our schools, studying the Asia region, but above all, they want to make known to other audiences the convenience them, the importance of strengthening the uh, friendship and respect we have each other. In those schools, uh, international fairs have been held, but not only as an academic activity, but the students go to the streets of Colima to show part of what they study. They have also seriously reproduced the Asian, the Asian model and have motivated, interested in studying international relations with Southeast Asian countries. And the, I want to talk uh, for more and more uh, interesting uh, features or uh, interest, interested between us uh, but of course, the, the time the time is gold in this case. To finish, let me show you a little part of Colima. Let me show you what is this. Of course, it's a, a volcano, but which volcano is? Correct Mexican audience is the volcano uh, of uh, is el volcán de fuego de Colima but also correct Indonesian audience. It is the Merapi volcano. The Merapi volcano is on your left and the volcano of Colima is on your right. The idea of showing you this is to refer on how it is bene uh, benefic for both countries to strengthen scientific technical cooperation. Uh, to mitigate the disasters that an um, aeroship can cause. It's only one, only one example that uh, we, we uh, work together. And finally, how not to mention to Alejandro Rangel Hidalgo, a Mexican artist, painter, graphic designer, and artisan recognized by the UNICEF for, uh, for his Christmas collection cards. He has another collection named Angels of This World and painted the angel of Indonesia with its characteristics, flora and fauna. The original lithograph is in the Nogueras University Museum uh, in Comala, Colima. He born in Colima too. So what do you think? Indonesia and Me Mexico should be close in many areas and students, scholars, diplomats, and institutions, we should work together for our societies. Thank you very much. Uh, gracias, Indonesia, and terima kasih, Mexico. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Reyes Lopez. It is now turn uh, of Risa Nor Arfani, a scholar in international relations, international political economy, with 10, 20 plus years of experience in academic teaching and research, works and policy consultancy. Major topics and issues of his interest include international trade, environment and governance and conflict management. Since, to, since 2010, has worked with the World Trade Organization under its academic chairs program and other trade related international research centers and networks. He is an expert in managing higher education workspace and international collaborations since the end of the 1990s at the Department of International Relations, Faculty of Social and Political Sciences of the University of Gajamada in Yogyakarta, Indonesia. He will this time elaborate on Indonesia's academic vision of Mexico and Latin America. Please, uh, Professor, uh, you have 10 minutes, go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Martin. Nice to meet you all. Um, and uh, thank you very much also for uh, giving me the opportunity to share my thought um, in this morning in Indonesia and uh, the evening in Mexico. Excellency Ambassador Cepi Wartono, Pak Cepi, salam kenal. Uh, also Excellency Mr. Armando Alvarez. Um, Excellency, nice to meet you. Um, uh, Salam kenal, as we 
uh, talk in bahasa Indonesia. Professor Marisela Reyes Lopez, um, thank you very much uh, for a very enlightening um, um, presentation. And uh, thank you for mentioning uh, uh, Marapi Volcano. Uh, I, I just uh, aware that now we have uh, counterparts um, uh, to, to work with um, uh, uh, in this um, disaster um, related uh, area. Yeah, as you mentioned in, in your presentation, uh, uh, yeah, it last erupted in 2010, where uh, it, it's a quite a big eruption uh, back then. But then international community um, uh, hold a very uh, successful efforts to recover uh, the area from uh, the uh, disaster, including Mexico, uh, I believe, um, in, in, in uh, that uh, very unfortunate moment. And uh, Aji Nugroho, salam kenal. Uh, um, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, my students um, and uh, colleagues, uh, students from Colima uh, University in Mexico. Um, again, I would like um, to share um, uh, some of my thoughts uh, that uh, probably um, uh, will be useful for uh, connecting the two dots between uh, Universitas Gajah Mada and University of Colima, Indonesia and Mexico uh, in the future. And uh, let me share my screen. Um, I, yes. I have an address of uh, Rahmat. Pak Rahmat, um, Paramat here, right? Um, Paramat, uh, nice to meet you. Okay, uh, Paramat is our head of the department at um, uh, uh, International Relations of Gajah Mada University. Um, okay, let let uh, let me start uh, my presentation uh, by um, introducing myself um, as also part of um, a society called as um, Sociedad Indonesia para America Latina. Um, a society founded in this Faculty of Social and Political Sciences at uh, our university to sort of also um, collect together and uh, um, uh, discuss um, our uh, interest to Latin America. And uh, we have been uh, working closely with the Embassy of Mexico in Jakarta since then. Uh, so uh, the uh, society founded in 2008 and uh, um, we have a, a, a very good collaboration with Mexican embassy, even with the consulate general in um, in in Yogyakarta, right, Alonso? Um, you still have it um, now in in Jogja? It's a honorary consul, yes. A honorary consul, yeah. We have been yeah. uh, uh, working very closely with this uh, consul since then, since two thousand eight. Uh, we have been uh, um, uh, um, uh, conducting so many activities, including the one that very similar to the uh, activities conducted in Colima University. We dance. Uh, we uh, uh, we have samba. We have a uh, um, uh, tango a session. We have culinary exchanges between students. Uh, we have a uh, um, um, arts festival and and so on. And uh, some of the students attending this two meeting now, uh, maybe we, uh, they can also share um, their experience in doing so in the past um, uh, uh, three years uh, uh, with this um, CIPAL. Yeah. We call it CIPAL um, uh, as, uh, as a society. So not, uh, now let's, um, I begin with the presentation uh, with this uh, outline. So I have um, three major parts in my presentation. The first one uh, will touch upon the context of Indonesia, Mexico, and Latin America relations. Uh, in, in this uh, a specific um, uh, part, I will talk about uh, very briefly historical trajectories of the two countries and two regions, um, Southeast Asia and Latin America, uh, how they share a social cultural identity and also how to look at from the perspective of the global South as it relates to the global North. Yeah. And then uh, in, in the second part, I will talk uh, more on um, the uh, notions of um, having uh, shared um, identity um, in three major areas socioculturally, and also probably also ideologically, and secondly, on economic, and then lastly, on political foreign affairs and uh, diplomacy. 
um, I, I would call it as parallelism or probably in, in Spanish, I don't know. Um, I don't speak Spanish. Uh, parallelismo, is that the correct word? I don't know. Uh, okay, uh, sort of like uh, um, I, I try to give it uh, the idea that we have parallel um, 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 uh, issue in, in industry um, areas. And then in, in the last part, I will try to, um, uh, to suggest some, um, uh, some issue that probably could connect um, the two countries, the two regions, and uh, giving uh, sort of like a roadmap um, to do so um, in the future. Uh, the first one uh, would be these uh, uh, trajectories. Um, I would say that uh, the two regions, the two countries, has a very similar um, uh, uh, trajectories in terms of their historical path to, in, in Indonesian case, probably to independence, to sovereignty, uh, beginning in 1950s, 1940s, to the 1970s, where we have um, then um, 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 a, a very specific um, 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 trajectory in which I think um, you know very well um, uh, the, um, uh, the strong government of, uh, we call it new order, uh, been there since 1967. And then uh, uh, to that, then we, we begin to develop um, our um, international um, uh, presence uh, also to Latin America. In Mexico, I think as I also learned quite a lot um, on this uh, specific country, um, you have uh, this political revolutionary institutionalization since the beginning of the 20th century, where I think uh, democratic dynamics and legacies, uh, but also disruption um, uh, happen, uh, uh, happen um, to be something that uh, um, uh, uh, pre preciously to be learned by our society in um, Indonesia, uh, especially since 1930s. Uh, I will talk about that uh, later on. Yeah? And then also um, in terms of development and how uh, with the two countries connect to, um, to, the, to the global society, we have also um, shared similar trajectory since the globalization era in 1980s, in which I think uh, democratization, democracy have become the, uh, um, the core norms um, of, of the trajectory. So that's um, uh, to give you the idea that uh, we have this uh, trajectory of, of both nations and both, um, both um, 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 uh, regions. And then um, I'll try also to sort of like having this outlook of the global south, how to connect it uh, with um, our um, um, uh, shared um, sociocultural identity in terms of development, how we really um, uh, oriented towards the economy, especially since 1970s, 1980s, to commercial um, enterprise, how we, both of us, both, the, both countries, also uh, um, uh, have um, uh, a tendency for a populist, military, uh, presidentialism, non-aligned political legacies, uh, values, and um, agenda, and it's um, our democratic um, encounters, and that's the one that uh, probably we need to talk about. And also how the two societies also incline to uh, what I call as popular orientations of culture and um, social relations. The one that probably um, uh, the two societies also have this. And um, with these three um, orientation, I would say that we have common imaginations of how we um, uh, see the world, yeah? of how we, how we um, see the North and South um, uh, uh, um, relations. Uh, um, I, I don't know if um, Mexico would um, uh, um, uh, um, perceive themselves as um, the global South, but in Indonesia, we have this. We have this um, uh, um, scheme of South-South cooperations. And I, I believe uh, uh, giving the uh, very unique uh, place of Mexico in, in the world economy, in, in world politics, the global south would be also uh, very similar in terms of um, uh, the, um, the um, imaginations how they um, uh, uh, connect uh, to the global north. And then I'll, I'll come to the next um, part. Um, and I would say that uh, the first one would be sociocultural one, or, or I would say also ideological one. Um, in, in terms of um, 
politics, for example, ideology, we have this uh, party, very dominant party. Uh, we call it uh, Gol Karya, Golongan Karya. In Mexico, uh, I, I believe also you have the PRI, uh, Partido Revolutionary Institutional. Both parties have very similar paths um, in terms of how they're doing the politics, how they um, uh, struggle with the power, um, uh, how they deal with the development um, uh, area. Uh, but um, I would um, uh, highlight here that is that um, uh, probably um, um, the struggles um, is probably um, on um, on how we perceive um, the um, the roles of the military, the roles of um, uh, the so-called um, army um, in in the two parts of the country. We have this dual function um, in, in in Mexico. I believe you have also these um, traditions of caudillismo. Uh, where I think um, um, probably it's it been changed pretty much since the democratization era. Um, but that's the, the one that we have. And we have the struggles to um, societal movement, conflicts um, over land, societal inequality, human rights, um, environment-related, successionist movement um, in the then, uh, for example, in Aceh, yeah, uh, the Gerakan uh, Aceh Merdeka, the GAM, um, Free Aceh Movement, we, we have... Um, solve the problem. We have um, no um, an agreement with uh, with uh, this uh, movement. Even now, we have a special status for Aceh, but currently we still have problems in Papua uh, with the uh, the successionist movement. And I believe we could learn a lot from Mexico how uh, you deal with, uh, for example, Zapatista movement, the Easy um, LN, and that's the thing that uh, we have learned uh, from uh, uh, this perspective. In, uh, especially in my class, yeah. I've been teaching uh, the class of politics and government of Latin America since um, uh, probably 25 years ago. Um, in, um, in, in my department, in our department, we have been introducing this course since 1980s. So, so many um, um, attentions um, to, to, to this. And also um, in, in terms of um, uh, foreign policy um, or economic independence, uh, we have also uh, um, uh, share uh, with uh, uh, Mexico in terms of how we should um, 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 respond to globalization, how we should respond to uh, the roles of, for example, the WTO or um, uh, the uh, World Bank. And I think we also learn a lot from uh, Mexican scholars, Mexican um, activists, social activists, how to do that. And um, I learned a lot also from uh, Professor or, uh, Maricela, on how you are um, doing uh, this research on on how to connect uh, with uh, with this um, uh, specific issue, but also in terms of culture, uh, we also share this um, a very sim uh, similar uh, trajectory. Uh, we, for example, um, uh, uh, pretty much love um, uh, telenovela, um, uh, the <laughs> Mexican-based uh, uh, um, television program. Uh, it was very popular in 1980s, 1990s, and I believe so in, in still. Um, they, are, they are still popular, but also we still have uh, this um, uh, uh, inclination, affinity to Mexican or Latin American uh, footballers or um, soccer players. Um, uh, Mexico is one of the favorite team um, in, in our society in Indonesia. So when you play, when Brazilian play, when Argentina play, Almost um, many, many, um, uh, many, many members of our society always watch. Um, so, vice versa, I think um, in terms of um, how Mexico um, deal with these uh, um, cultural um, things, I think Mexico and many Latin American countries, other Latin American countries, um, have these um, uh, um, uh, um, leading cultural blocks in which I think um, uh, in, in terms of um, uh, um, what do you call it, the role modeling, uh, Latino, Latina uh, people have been our role models in, in terms of this, or even in this counterculture um, uh, um, ideas. Um, che Guevara, for example, is very popular um, uh, figure um, uh, among, uh, among um, uh, even now, among millennials. Yeah? If you go to Jogja, um, uh, and um, I, I would say that uh, you, you should um, uh, in, um, visit Jogja someday. Um, as I 
I should visit Kolima, uh, probably. I, I haven't have the opportunity to visit uh, uh, Mexico, but uh, um, I really uh, uh, want to go there, uh, to Kolima for, um, especially, uh, to see uh, uh, the similarity between us. Yeah? Uh, but if you go to Jogja and go to this um, street of Malioboro, then you could find anything uh, related to Latin, Latin culture. Uh, including this uh, picture of Che, Che Guevara. Uh, they are, uh, he's everywhere. Um, uh, uh, he's quite, quite popular in, in, uh, in, uh, among uh, the youngsters. Yeah. And, and also in terms of um, our aspirations to be agricultural nation or maritime society, that's also really similar to what happens in Latin America, in Mexico, but also very similar in terms of how we struggle to, to make it... Uh, as a policy practices, um, we, we lack um, of that. And uh, um, um, since I joined the WTO chairs program in 2010, we, uh, we have been uh, in contact with uh, some, with, uh, some uh, uh, South American, Central American, including Mexico, uh, uh, Me Mexican uh, scholars. We, we talk a lot on how to exchange knowledge. And I, I, I really, agree with uh, what Professor Marisela uh, concerned about on technical um, exchange. Yeah. We, 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 we really need that um, and, and, and we could begin with uh, university to university level. Um, I, I'll touch about, up, upon that uh, later on. And this one is the economic uh, parallelism. I would say that um, uh, these four um, um, area could be the the, um, uh, um, the centers of our um, 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 attention, regional integration, or we could also um, talk about interregional corporation. Um, the um, uh, uh, Cepi, Duta Besar Cepi mentions about the uh, possibility to connect ASEAN and uh, uh, FELAC, uh, but I would say that um, um, uh, there are also many, many opportunities to be developed uh, among um, ASEAN and uh, um, AFTA, uh, with AFTA and um, Mexico with uh, uh, um, NAFTA or no USMCA. Uh, and also in terms of South South cooperation, plus plus, yeah. Um, uh, um, Indonesia and Mexico um, share a membership in G20 um, along with Argentina and Brazil. And that's a very good uh, opportunity to, um, uh, to setting up um, uh, the Global South um, agenda with regards uh, with relations to the, the global north. And also Mexico, uh, along with uh, Chile, Colombia, and uh, uh, Costa Rica, is a member of OECD countries. The thing that probably uh, um, uh, um, uh, make um, you as a potential hubs to connect uh, the global south agenda to the global uh, north. And then also in cross-sectoral dialogue, we need uh, these things, we need this um, um, to connect uh, these two regions to be dialogue partners. Um, uh, in, in the future, I would say that Mexico should be ASEAN um, dialogue partner or Latin America in, um, in general to be um, uh, our uh, um, strategic uh, partner. Um, in terms of challenges as a middle uh, income economies, uh, um, um, yes, in, in Indonesia, no, um, the status of um, our economy now is um, lower middle, but um, uh, probably um, it, it, um, uh, we need to learn a lot from Mexico how to deal with this um, status of middle income um, economies, as uh, we need to also um, escape um, ourselves from these uh, middle income traps, um, the one that uh, also uh, be the uh, um, serious challenges for um, uh, countries like Indonesia and, uh, and Mexico. And then finally, in terms of political parallelism, uh, this um, uh, um, uh, notions of dialogue partners, relations among entities, uh, pa Cepi, uh, pa Duta Besar Cepi mentions about the importance of connecting the two countries um, under the P2P, people to people. But probably what we need is how to, um, make benefit from our intermediary, intermediary institution, uh, the uh, parliamentary judicial bodies, business organizations, policy think tanks, academic institution, just like um, uh, uh, Kolima University and also uh, my university, Kajamada University, 
but also civil society organizations and other stakeholders. Uh, in, in, in doing so, we, we could then uh, project to the so-called socio-cultural diplomacy, the thing that uh, the uh, Mexican uh, foreign affairs are also really um, uh, um, underlined yeah, in, in, in the past five years of your um, efforts um, to diplomacy. Um, uh, to create, um, to find similarities, and then to understand um, uh, um, uh, um, how to understand stereotypes um, uh, among the two countries. Um, and, and in doing so, then um, we need to think about uh, the notions of development diplomacy. And then I'll come to the last slide, um, how to, um, uh, to come to the development diplomacy. I would say the first one uh, probably is uh, the need to cooperate interregionally. And as Professor Maricela mentioned, um, there is no, um, uh, no uh, barriers to do so. Yeah? Uh, we have a connection in, in trade, um, uh, in investment, we have um, uh, um, uh, uh, connecting to that technical cooperation in major area de uh, development uh, by way of having epistemic communities, organic intellectuals. And I really am happy to have uh, this uh, uh, first annual uh, sem uh, seminar uh, initiated by both um, embassies um, in, in the two parts of the country because it creates uh, the foundations of this epistemic community. And uh, we are happy to um, uh, follow up um, yeah, uh, these uh, seminars uh, for any, any exchanges. And now I think uh, we have uh, um, a blessing in disguise of this pandemic. Uh, now we, we could have a regular basis um, uh, a Zoom meeting, for example, um, monthly or bi-monthly or even probably um, uh, could have an um, um, annual seminar um, in, in, um, um, in six months period um, to, uh, to check uh, to, to what happened. And then how to connect um, the, the development to diplomacy. I would say that the uh, first one uh, we have need to construct development cooperation schemes. And uh, we could construct that with our business sectors, uh, where I think production networks, supply and value chains are there. Um, and I believe both countries have the capacity to do so, especially in automotive and electronic industry. Um, we have the capacity to do, to do so. Um, uh, and uh, uh, by way of that, we could then um, having more um, um, constructing development uh, cooperation schemes, bilateral schemes uh, for official development assistance. Uh, we have this, uh, as I mentioned, this um, uh, source, source cooperation, where I think uh, um, uh, um, Mexico could serve as the um, uh, um, uh, um, triangular um, uh, um, party um, to, to connect with this uh, source, source cooperation scheme. Multi-track diplomacy, university-based collaborative projects. We could start from um, Kajamada and Kolima, yeah? Uh, professor, we, we could uh, soon start um, uh, the projects, yeah. As now we have these um, uh, um, students, yeah? my students and your students um, to connect. And um, I have um, uh, um, got quite a lot of um, um, initiatives, um, ideas um, uh, um, uh, to connect uh, the two countries and the two regions uh, in terms of um, this multi-track uh, diplomacy. And then finally, um, the strategy could be uh, probably what immediate no, what we need um, um, immediately is probably what, by the help of our both countries' embassies um, uh, to initiate Indonesia-Mexico eminent person groups, uh, where I think uh, we could have both sides um, uh, representatives and uh, university uh, academia could be part of that, but also business sectors yeah, and also community uh, uh, um, uh, leaders uh, and, and so forth. And um, in the medium and long term, yes, we need uh, this um, to, to be a, a follow up um, uh, on um, high level meetings, probably, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we need uh, to officially um, initiate um, uh, um, ASEAN FEALAC um, strategic uh, partnership or, or uh, Mexico becoming um, 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 a strategic dialogue partner of ASEAN. So uh, that's, um, uh, that's all, uh, um, Mar uh, Alonso, thank you very much. Um. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Fani. It was indeed very interesting, your presentation. Uh, 
So we're, we're going to have Aji's presentation. Have Aji's presentation now. So Aji Nugrono has a BA in International Relations at Gajamada University and a Master of International Relations at Monash University, Australia. Currently, he is Minister Counselor, Head of Economic Affairs at the Embassy of Indonesia to Mexico. Previously, he served as, as a diplomat at the embassies of Indonesia to Libya and at the Holy See. His presentation is titled Business Opportunities Between Indonesia and Mexico. Please, Pak Aji, you have 10 minutes. Go ahead. Thank you, Alonso. Please let me share my screen first. Excellencies, Ambassador Jet Bartono and Ambassador Armando Alvarez Reina, Dr. Maricela Reyes Lopez, uh, Professor Riza Nur Avarni, my professor, because actually I took your class, Pak Riza, 25 oh, years really? ago. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I, I, I didn't know that they were part of Kajamada. <laughs> <laughs> because okay. at the time I, I had long hair, but okay. <laughs> you, you didn't recognize me. <laughs> and Pak Rahmat Nur uh, the head of uh, international relations, Kajabar uh, University. Dear colleague students, Buenas noches, Atodos, uh, and Mexico. And Selamat pagi, Bapak Ibu semua di Indonesia. First of all, let me allow me to convey my gratitude to Ambassador Armando as well as the team uh, for inviting us to this important event. And it is my great honor to be at the same panel with all the great panelists here, especially because I can go back to my campus even though it's virtually. And Secondly, please allow me to share my point of view and my thought and as well as something that I know um, regarding the economic relations between Indonesia and Mexico. Let me begin with moving back to the establishment of diplomatic uh, relations between our countries. Like uh, Ambassador Cepi Wartono said um, previously, that today, we celebrate the 68th anniversary of the diplomatic relations between Indonesia and Mexico. And after that, um, the trade relations between Indonesia and Mexico increased significantly, as you can see here in, the, in this table. From only 6.5 million Mexican pesos in 1957 to 140 million Mexican pesos in 1961 so it increased more than 20 times in only four years during this period our first president president sukarno had visited mexico uh, three times and in 1961 president sukarno and president Adolfo lopez Mateos signed an agreement to boost our country's trade relations it is also mentioned by professor maricela according to Banco Nacional de Comercio Exterior or Banco Mex. Based on the agreement, Indonesia would buy from Mexico products such as cotton and its products, iron pipes and steel, and uh, footwear. While Mexico would buy from Indonesia products such as rubber, cinnamon, black pepper, and tea. Thanks to President Lopez Matios, who chose the specific products so that Indonesia that just got its independence without strong manufacturing sectors seems to be a potential trade partner for Mexico. So the choices of the products were strategically uh, taken by both leaders to strengthen our relations. Unfortunately, after 40 years, the growth of our trade relation was not as good as the early period. I could not find the exchange, uh, the exchange rate of Mexican peso to US dollar in 1961. I could only find until 1970 that it was uh, one US dollar equal to nine Mexican pesos. Let's say in 1961, it was seven uh, Mexican pesos for one US dollar. 
The trade volume in 1961 was 140 million Mexican pesos, so it was around 20 million US dollar. But after 40 years, in 2001, it was less than 300 million US dollar. It increased only less than 15 times compared to 20 times in four years as we saw in the previous slide. Fortunately, it increased significantly in 2010 and 2012. Until 2009, our trade only reached around 500 million US dollar. Then it was almost doubled in 2010. Furthermore, as we can see in the graphic, in 2012, uh, Mexico's export to Indonesia at around 580 million US dollar was almost leveled as Indonesia's export to Mexico, which was around 620 million US dollar. It happened when the U.S. had economic recession and the European countries also still had prolonged recession which led to financial and economic crisis. This condition has led many countries around the world to proactively find new market opportunities to boost economic growth. In this case, Mexico finds Indonesia as the new market where its export to Indonesia can grow around 200% in only two years. But unfortunately, it decreased in the next two years, though it seems that it grew afterwards, especially in 2017 and 18, but still far below its peak in 2012. For the last four to five years, Indonesia and Mexico trade volume has been steady in around 1.1 to 1.2 billion US dollars per year. And even with the disruption caused by COVID-19 pandemic in 2000, in 2020, according to the Indonesian Ministry of Trade, trade volume between Indonesia and Mexico reached 1.206 billion US dollar, increased by 0.1%. I believe that this figure shows us how strong is the basis of trade relations between Indonesia and Mexico. Furthermore, in the first seven months of this year, our trade volume reach 826.6 million US dollar, an increase of around 22.2% than the same period of past year. Hopefully this figure will continue to increase along the year. On investment field, according to data from the Secretaria de Economia of Mexico, Indonesia has invested in Mexico through Indorama Ventures in the city of Querétaro since 2011 with initial mm -hmm. investment about 200 million US dollar. And since then, this venture has been investing in Mexico and now the total investment is more than 300 million US dollar. On the other part, so far we have success story of two Mexican companies investing in Indonesia. Kidzania has been one of the most favorite places for Indonesian children to play since 2007. Jakarta was the second city outside Mexico that has Kidzania. And now, due to the growing demand, another city in Indonesia, Surabaya, has also Kidzania. Uh, and in 2019, thanks to the investment made by Cinepolis, 56 cinemas in Indonesia has been rebranded as Cinepolis. The decisions made by Kidzania and Cinepolis show that the market in Indonesia is big and so promising. It leads to the next slide about what are the potential that we can find in Indonesia and Mexico. Like I just said, with around 270 million inhabitants, Indonesia is very big and promising market. Moreover, with the stable foreign direct investment, Indonesia also has an expanding middle class with in increasing purchasing power. The country's GDP per capita has already risen from around 800 US dollar in the year of 2000 uh, to 4000 uh, US dollar in 2020. Additionally, now we have Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership or RCEP. In November last year, 10 members of ASEAN or ANSEA in Spanish, Asociación de Naciones del Sureste Asiático, together with China, Japan, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand signed this partnership and become the world's biggest trade deal. Altogether, these 15 countries have 2.2 billion population. 
the combined GDP of the 15 signatories was 26.2 trillion US dollar last year, or 28% of global GDP, while they accounted for approximately 30% of the world's economic output. Furthermore, this region, Southeast Asia and East Asia, are the fastest growing regions in the world for the last two decades, so the opportunities are wide open. On the other hand, Indonesia can see Mexico as its promising economic partner as well. With the US, Mexico and Canada Free Trade Agreement or USMCA has entered into force in July 2020, the flow of goods from Mexico to the US and Canada will increase. Even before USMCA entered into force, Mexico has been the biggest trade partner of the United States. In addition, with the current trade war between the US and China, Mexico could be the real winner of the war. As its biggest suppliers, the US will look into Mexico to substitute the disrupted supply of Chinese products. Therefore, due to USMCA and the US-China trade war, the demand of Mexican products will increase significantly. It means that Mexico will need more material or products to fulfill the demand from the US. In this connection, Indonesia can support Mexico to supply the materials or product needed. However, we must admit that there are some challenges in strengthening our country's economic relations. Despite the fact that Indonesia and Mexico have big potential to have stronger partnership in terms of economy, the figure of our trade volume has been stuck for quite a while. Some of the challenges we face are the lack of knowledge between each other, as Mexicans don't know a lot about Indonesia and the other way around. Because of this, there's only limited experiences that direct relation between Mexican and Indonesia companies, which in turn leads to the tri triangulation of trade. For example, Indonesia export products to the United States, which are then re-exported to Mexico. This is also related with another challenge we face, that currently we don't have a bilateral trade agreement. Without trade agreement and additional cost for the third party, it makes Mexican products less competitive in Indonesia and vice versa. It is really difficult to compete if the price is higher. To deal with the basic challenges, the government of Indonesia is trying to build bridges to bring our business community closer and to learn about each other. And starting 2019, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia has an annual event to connect with business communities in Indonesia and the region called the INAL Indonesia and Latin America and the Caribbean Business Forum, or INALA, a forum which is especially connected mm -hmm. to connect Indonesian business communities with their counterparts from Latin America and the Caribbean, including Mexico. The government of the Republic of Indonesia has put Latin America and the Caribbean as the new potential trading partner, whereas Mexico is the priority. In 2019, there were 14 Mexican business people visited Jakarta and participated in the first INALAC. And last year, due to the pandemic, INALAC Business Forum was held as a hybrid event, where 13 Mexican business people participated virtually. Through INALAC Business Forum, in the 2020, we witnessed signing ceremony of three business memorandum of understandings between three Indonesian companies and three Mexican companies, with a business potential of more than 70 million US dollar. In line with the virtual event since 2020, INALAC offers an, an online platform for business communities in Indonesia and in Latin America and the Caribbean to exhibit their products and or services to each other. And as of now, there are 15 Mexican companies use INALAC online platform to showcase their products. This year, INALAC Business Forum is planned to be held as a hybrid format once again on October 14 to 15, 2021. Uh, in this event, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia will formally inaugurate the transformation of INALAC online platform into InAccess, which will involve more business communities. Actually, InAccess.com was launched a month ago. So uh, we can already use this uh, website to register ourselves. So if any of you interested mm -hmm. to participate or have products to be promoted, 
uh, I invite you to register yourself or your companies. And it is uh, all free of charge or gratis. And to end my presentation, I would like to say that I believe that when business communities from both countries know each other, the door to strengthen our economic relation will be wide, uh, wide open. As we saw in the beginning of my presentation, we have proved that in 2010 and 2012, if we try to seek the opportunities and diversify the market, the trade will increase significantly. It is true that in Mexico and Indonesia are ge geographically far apart. However, I prefer to quote the first president of the Republic of Indonesia when he visited Mexico to meet President Lopez Mateos in 1960. At the time, uh, President Sukarno said that, uh, I quote, Our shores are washed by the same water of Pacific Ocean, that both countries, Indonesia and Mexico, are connected by Pacific Ocean. Or in um, Professor Maricela words, uh, there's no wall between us in uh, Pacific Ocean. So I think it's our time to consider that the Pacific Ocean is something that unites us. Gracias for your attention. Thank you. Terima kasih. Thank you, Aji, uh, for your presentation. Indeed, it uh, adds to our uh, overview of the uh, bilateral relationship. Uh, we're going to continue our, our dialogue. Uh, let me introduce to you to my colleague, Liz Aceves Serrano. Liz is a Mexican diplomat who studied law at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. She also has studies at the University of Queensland in Australia. She obtained a diploma on Asian studies by the uh, University, uh, National University Autonomous of Mexico. In 2001, Liz was awarded with the Gabino Barreda Medal for Outst Outstanding Academic Performance. In 2007, she was Assistant Professor of International Crime Procedures at the National Institute of Criminal Science of Mexico. Liz has experience on human rights at the Office in Mexico of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights and the, Ministry of, and the Mexican Ministry of Foreign Affairs. As a member of Foreign Service, she was posted to the Embassy of Mexico in Japan as Head of Legal Affairs and Protection of Mexicans Abroad. She is currently in charge of Consular and Cultural Affairs at the Embassy of Mexico in Jakarta. Her presentation is titled Cultural Identities Between Mexico and Indonesia. Liz, you have 10 minutes. Let me remind you that uh, you are uh, feel free to uh, write uh, your questions at the chat box here, and the, at the end of the uh, presentation, we'll have a question and answer session. Please, Liz, go ahead. Thank you very much indeed. Salamat pagi di Indonesia. Buenas noches in Mexico. Um, today, I will talk about the cultural identities between Mexico and Indonesia. At first sight, it could be hard to find cultural identities between both nations, considering that we are thousands of kilometers far away. So um, as I was saying, um, Mexico and Indonesia are thousands of kilometers far away, practically more than 15,000. Oh, thank you, perfect. F uh, next slide, please, it's uh, where it's the map. So uh, as we may see, we are far, very, very far apart. But uh, despite being geographical antipodies, Indonesia and Mexico have a long list of similarities, even on the cultural field. Both are multi-ethnic and multicultural countries with huge historical and cultural legacies. Just as Indonesia was the center for the civilizing zone known as Nusantara, Mexico was also the center for the civilizing zone known as Mesoamerica or Middle America. Although both countries are characterized as middle powers in the economic and political fields, culturally, both are great powers worldwide. Mexico is Indonesia's second oldest ally in Latin America. Dating back on the 18th century, Mexico and Indonesia undirectly had their first contact through the Manila Galleon under the Spanish colonial regime. 
this maritime route, which connected Asia, the Americas, Europe, and even Africa was more than a platform exchange of goods. It also gave the opportunity to exchange ideas and cultures, which is very important. Next slide, please. Um, though the most notable contact happened in 1930 when Miguel Covarrubias, one of the most important Mexican visual artists of the 20th century, traveled to Bali more than 90 years ago. That trip became a watershed for the Mexican artist and began a new chapter in the artistic history between Mexico and Indonesia. Despite Mexico and Indonesia being separated by the vast waters of the Pacific Ocean, Miguel Covarrubias managed to find many similarities in their customs and traditions. In 1933, with the support of the Guggenheim Fellowship, Covarrubias and his wife came back to Bali to further study the culture and traditions of the island. The product of his research was a book called The Island of Bali, or in Indonesian, Pulau Bali, written in 1937, which remains a worldwide reference of the Balinese culture. In late 2020, we celebrated the 19th anniversary of the first visit of Covarrubias to Bali, and it was meaningful to acknowledge that his work is still universally recognized and appreciated by the Balinese people. In the words of the Emeritus Professor of Isid and Pasar, one uh, institution very important culturally speaking, Iguayandivia said, for me personally, and I believe for many people, this book is like a Bible to us because it's a rare documentation that can tell us about Bali in the early times. Next slide, please. Similarities and ties between Mexico and Indonesia could also be found in the most quotidian yet vital form of culture, gastronomy. At first sight, when we think about it, we could uh, say like, oh yes, we both are foodies. Uh, we also um, like spicy food and we have street food. Yes, indeed. But the relation is beyond that, it's, it's deeper. The gastronomic similarities can be found in several aspects. The use of chili as an important ingredient in many of our cuisines, the abundance of, of fruits, and similar techniques in food preparation. As an example, if you see uh, this slide, at the bottom we have like a thing made out of stone. If you see it, it could be a molcajete or it could be a cobet. It depends on which part of the world you are. If you're in Indonesia, it's a comic, and if you are in Mexico, it's Montajete. Regarding food, as an example, on the right side at the top, you have a tamale or lemper. Well, it depends. Uh, lemper is the one on the left side, and it's uh, made out of uh, rice dough, and it has uh, banana leaves. And on the right side, you have a Mexican tamale, which is made out of corn dough and it has banana leaves. Well, apart from that, products from Mexico, such as chilies, beans, avocado, corn, tomato, cacao, vanilla, and jaicama or benjuan are widely consumed in Indonesia. Likewise, Indonesian native products such as cinnamon, cloves, and nutmeg are also consumed in Mexico. It is also worth mentioning that the research of the agricultural engineer Jesus Patiño Navarrete, who visited several countries in 1939, including Indonesia, with the objective of searching for plants and fruits that could be suitable for cultivation in Mexico, mango, rambutan, jackfruit, and even palm oil can now be found in Mexico. Years later, he became the Mexico's vice Minister of Agriculture and Head of the Cultural Institute Mexico, Indonesia. Uh, next slide, please. Also, Mexican pop culture is presented in Indonesia. As uh, Professor Risa said, telenovelas. Millions of Indonesians have watched Mexican telenovelas. Between the 90s and early 2000s, Mexican telenovelas were extremely popular in Indonesia and have shaped the nostalgic memory of many Indonesian people today. Next slide, please. A 
at the Embassy of Mexico, we are trying to have a social cultural journey that could lead us to have cultural events that will help us to intertwine with due respect both cultures and show that even though we are very far apart, we are closer with culture. Um, we can observe the power of culture in establishing social ties between both nations. Although indeed, distance has always been a major barrier in strengthening the relations between both countries. Culture and contact between the people of Mexico and Indonesia has proven to overcome such barrier. It is also important to acknowledge that culture and its role as a bridge to connect and invigorate friendship beyond distance is hugely influential. So uh, please uh, visit us uh, in our social media, follow us. Uh, we will have incredible events and uh, you can learn more about Mexican culture or the relation Mexico and Indonesia. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Liz, uh, for your insightful pre presentation. Uh, we're gonna continue with uh, our last but not least con uh, presentation. It will be presented by uh, Ambassador Armando Alvarez, um, Ambassador of Mexico to Indonesia. Uh, Ms. Uh, Mr. Alvarez is a career diplomat since 1988. He, Ambassador, obtained a bachelor's degree in international relations from the National Autonomous University of Mexico as well as a master's degree in international relations from the Deakin University in Melbourne, Australia. He also bears a master's degree in Higher Command and National Security by the Center of Naval Superior Studies of the Mexican Navy. Among, among other postings abroad, he has served, as, uh, he has served at the embassies of, uh, of Mexico to Guatemala and to South Korea, and has been head of mission to Costa Rica and Australia. In Mexico, he has been director general for Asia Pacific. Please, Ambassador, you have 10 minutes. Go ahead. Thank you, Padre Alonso. Good morning in Indonesia and good evening in Mexico. It is a real pleasure to participate in the webinar Indonesia and Mexico, two strategic partners across the Pacific Ocean organized by Universitas Gajamada and the University of Colima. My gratitude to the scholars and students of both prestigious universities, in particular to Dr. Maricela Reyes Lopez and Dr. Risa Noel Arfani, also to my dear colleague and friend, Ambassador Chepi Guartono, and the members of both embassies. Okay, I would like to devote my brief closing remarks to summarize the topics brilliantly presented by my predecessors. And in doing it, I will respond to, to the following questions. Why should Mexicans be interested in Indonesia? And why should Indonesians be interested in Mexico? Well, the short answer is because as we have seen previously, despite the huge distance between both countries, we have a very long list of historical, sociocultural, political and economic similarities and a remarkable coincidence in points of view uh, on the main international affairs, which open important avenues for cooperation in the benefit of both countries. Allow me to elaborate a little more <coughs> on, on these topics. Historical affinities. Both countries are the hairs of great civilizations that we already saw in the previous presentations. We both endured centuries of European colonialism, as uh, Professor Risa mentioned. After independence, we have managed to build strong national states. And we are both now building modern societies and economies. We have also managed to consolidate strong democracies and our nations are fully respectful of human rights for all people. Next, please. In the social cultural affinities, we are multi-ethnic and multicultural countries. Our population is remarkably young. We have thus a demographic bonus. We bet our future on educating those youngsters, like yourself, the ones who are participating now. We are a nation also of great artists, artisans, and cultural creators, as my predecessors have shown. We have a large diaspora to take care of. Uh, our countries are two of the 17 mega diverse countries. That this is very important because only 17 countries in the world 
have been named as mega diverse countries by, by, the, by the amount of mega diversity they, they, they possess, they own. Well, Mexico and Indonesia are two of them. And that is a great internal, but also a great uh, international responsibility. And finally, unfortunately, we are also two countries highly vulnerable to natural disasters, and that opens the possibility to cooperate uh, in, in between the two countries. Next, please. <clears throat> in the economic affinities, we are the 15 and 16 largest economies worldwide, and therefore we are members of the G20. We both are leaders in our respective subregions. Indonesia is the largest economy in ASEAN and Mexico is the largest economy in the Pacific Alliance and also is currently the coordinator of the CELAC, which is the community of Latin American and Caribbean states. Both countries are regional leaders in creative industries, as, as Aji mentioned, this is part of our exchange in cre creative industries, science and technology and e-commerce. We are also two nations fully open to free and fair international trade. Indonesia is part of the uh, ASEAN and other uh, uh, the multilateral and bilateral uh, economic treaties as Mexico is as well. Mexico has free trade agreement with more than 60 countries worldwide. And we are part of the two main trading blocks worldwide, the USMCA in the case of Mexico and RCEP in the case of Indonesia. Those are the two most important trade blocks currently, one in, in, in North America, USMCA, and one in Asia Pacific, the RCEP, and Mexico and Indonesia are part of them. Now, international coincidences, political coincidences. Next, please. Political coincidences. And, and here I will, I will uh, uh, take advantage to... To, to respond to uh, Nadia's question in the chat, she asked about, uh, she said, okay, we have a, a good economic relation, we have a good uh, cultural relation, but what about politics? What about political relation? Well, <clears throat> I can tell you, Nadia, that our relation is eminently a political relation. We have an excellent political communication between Mexico and Indonesia. Our, our ties are bolstered by our trust in international law and the multilateral system. We strongly believe in dialogue to achieve the peaceful resolution of disputes. We are partners in fora like the UN, in particular the UN Security Council. In, in, in the previous uh, 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 period, Indonesia was, part, was a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council. Now Mexico is a, 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 a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council, and we are working together addressing the most important and relevant international issues. <clears throat> like, for instance, at this moment, the, the, the issue of, of Myanmar within the UN Security Council. <clears throat> we are members of also of the WTO. We are members of APEC, which is more than, more than, than a mere economic uh, uh, institution. APEC is also a, a political uh, body that, that, that tries to bring together all the participants. And we are part of MICTA. MICTA is a new, a new group that includes five countries, uh, as the acronym says. MICTA is Mexico, Indonesia, South Korea, Turkey, and Australia. What do they have in common? Well, at, at first sight, you, you could say practically nothing, but, but that is wrong. <clears throat> we speak different languages, we profess different religions, we live in different, in different uh, regions or neighborhoods in the world. And however, we have strong ties because we, are, we all are middle powers. We all uh, believe in international law. We all believe in an open world. We, we all believe in a peaceful resolution of, uh, of conflicts. And we work together in the main international bodies like the G20. <clears throat> now, Indonesia is an observer of the Pacific Alliance and Mexico is represented before the ASEAN. Also, we share uh, views, internal views on fields like democracy, human rights, climate change, education, health, et cetera, both internally and internationally. And we work together in multilateral initiatives seeking uh, for constructive solutions to global issues from finance and economics to security, environment, and sustainable development. We believe in a rule-based international trading system and are supporters of free trade. And a recent case of our coincidence of interest and priorities are the joint efforts that uh, Mexico and Indonesia are doing to ensure global access to medicines, vaccines, and medical equipment to face the COVID pandemic. Both, work, both countries are working together in the UN to ensure that every country in the world ha has access 
to uh, medicines, vaccines, and medical equipment to face the pandemic. We, we both are, are, are convinced that no one will be safe until everyone is safe. <clears throat> All the former affinities uh, uh, have propitiated the creation of an important bilateral structure. Uh, <clears throat> our friendship, as, as uh, Pachepi mentioned, dates back to the very creation of the Indonesian state. We hold periodical high level consultations, a practice that reinforced mutual understanding and cooperation, and that has strengthened our historic friendship. We have signed 22, also, also that was mentioned by my, my predecessors, we have signed 22 bilateral agreements for cooperation in taxes, agriculture, environment, drug trafficking, culture, nu nuclear technology, among many other areas. <clears throat> uh, we have ongoing negotiations to conclude 18 more agreements in fields like legal assistance, education, culture, disaster management, fisheries, sports, and halal certifications. <clears throat> Students, Universities, think tanks, artists, and scholars from both countries seek to engage in joint initiatives with their counterparts, helping to consolidate our mutual understanding. We have a still, uh, we have a still incipient but growing economic relationship. As as pa Ajin mentioned, bilateral trade has uh, increased, uh, has quadrupled, has increased 400 percent in the last uh, 27 years, <clears throat> and uh, there are uh, reciprocal investment from companies from both countries. And however, that is, that is uh, important. We have not just established a bilateral trade agreement and our bilateral trade is regulated under the WT, uh, WTO rules. Conclusions, <clears throat> next please. In summary, in the last seven decades, Mexico and Indonesia have consolidated a strong association based on the genuine interest of their peoples and governments to get to know each other better and to strengthen ties of, of cooperation. Today, Mexico and Indonesia are two middle powers that are called to play an, a growingly important role in an increasingly multipolar world. The post-COVID-19 world will be vastly different than, than, we, than, than we know together. And we and will introduce new challenges, particularly in economy and trade, for which Mexico and Indonesia need to be prepared. The challenge for our countries is to find new ways to continue promoting bilateral interactions amidst, amidst a restrictive environment, a sanitary restrictive environment. To achieve these goals, Mexico and Indonesia must identify new areas of bilateral collaboration. Our countries have proven to be heavyweight when it comes to proposing and operating multilateral initiatives. They should continue strengthening their role as a growing pillars of the international system and must be prepared to respond to the most pressing global challenges. For doing that, that, we need more mutual knowledge. We need more Mexico in Indonesia and we need more Indonesia in Mexico. We need more Mexican and Indonesian official, business people, scientists, artists, and certainly more scholars, students, and think tanks uh, like you from both countries speaking among them. That is exactly uh, what the Universitas Gachamada and the University of, Columa, of Colima are doing at this seminar. Luckily, both universities have agreed to celebrate this exercise annually, as well as to explore mechanisms and areas of potential collaboration between them. So I would like to conclude my remarks by expressing my greatest appreciation to all the participants. And now it's time for you, the scholars and the students of both countries to express their points of view. Karima Kasi Banyak. Thank you, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, uh, we're now, uh, we'll continue with the uh, Q&A uh, &A session. I see there's uh, plenty of questions. We are uh, very happy to see the interest of, uh, from students from uh, both sides uh, of the Pacific Ocean. So this is quite exciting. I'm gonna uh, read questions on a, uh, First come, first, save, uh, first come, first serve basis. We received a question from uh, Gusti Duiva Kalich Sweri. Uh, he's, um, I'm going to read it uh, directly to the question. Are there any specific institutions that facilitates various information about studies in Latin America, which is, uh, which also in a way can connect two countries easily? For example, in Australia, there is an institution called the Australia-Indonesia Institution. I would be grateful and thankful 
uh, if any of you can provide uh, information on this uh, for uh, the students. Thank you so much. Uh, would any of you be interested in answering this question? Professors, uh, colleagues from the embassy? Um, uh, yes, please go ahead, Professor Reyes. Yes, I think the, the question is if there is an institution to help uh, foreign study, uh, students uh, to close to Latin America. And uh, here at the University uh, of Colima, uh, we have the International Relations for Students Office. So they could help uh, to the students uh, and um, to, to find to find in this in this um, university too because we are a part of Latin America so maybe in in this office uh, I will give you the uh, or write the information at the uh, in this university is the office of international relations for the students for foreign students mm -hmm. yes please write the, uh, the all this information on the chat room so mm -hmm. uh, our, our friend asking this question have the information. Okay, uh, if I may, I will also uh, complement uh, the reply of Professor Maricela. Please go ahead, uh, Liz. Thank you very much. Um, in general, I mean, uh, uh, institution uh, Mexico-Indonesia is not currently available. I mean, sometimes universities have like a, a specific um, office of international relations of, uh, or for students, etc. cetera. And, uh, but that doesn't mean that in the future we will not have it. I mean, we are taking steps, maybe the first steps to uh, make universities come together such as this event. This event, the main purpose is, as Ambassador um, Alvarez has said, to have an annual uh, a seminar regarding these topics. And also we hope that in the future, we could continue strengthening this relation and that these both universities could uh, help, uh, help us with this purpose, uh, trying to get, more, uh, get closer. That's all. Thank you, Liz. Uh, we're gonna follow on with the questions. Uh, we have a question from uh, Uka from the University of Gajamala. Uh, well, I'm gonna read it. Uh, I would like to ask a question about the dynamics of maquiladora in Mexico. I read many literature about NAFTA and how the agreement affect Mexico's economy rapidly. At the same time, there, there are still a lot of issues regarding labor exploitation. To address this issue, is there any regulation which apply to protect the labor rights there? Either it is from NAFTA itself or from the Mexican government. Thank you. May I? Yes, please go, go ahead, Ambassador. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, uh, let me speak a little bit about uh, the Mexico, the US and Canada uh, uh, relation. Uh, the current economic relation between Mexico, the US and Canada goes much beyond maquiladora or inbound industry. Actually, NAFTA is no longer in force. We have now a superior treaty called USMCA. And by the way, the, the trade in North America is not, is not only a border crossing trade, but it's, it's, it's a process of productive integration. Let me give you an example. Mexico is exporting more goods to the US, then uh, Germany, the UK, France, Italy, and Spain combined, all of them combined. Or in Asia Pacific, Mexico is exporting more goods to, <clears throat> to, uh, the US, to the US than China, Japan, and South Korea combined. And also the other way around, Mexico is importing a lot of goods from uh, the US and Canada. So we have a very deep productive integration with the US and Canada. The US now the new treaty, the USMCA has a stronger and more far-reaching labor provisions than, than, than NAFTA, which was the predecessor. This new agreement 
contains a labor chapter that prioritizes labor obligations, including them in the core of the agreement and making them fully enforceable. That is one of the reasons why the, why the Americans, uh, the US government uh, demanded to, to negotiate a new, a new treaty because they wanted uh, stricter and, and, and superior uh, labor and environmental uh, <coughs> rules. Okay, in, in, the, in the frame of the, of the new treaty, the USMCA, Mexico uh, has been working hand in hand with, with the, the private sector for the implementation of this agreement. We have enacted re internal reforms to improve minimum wages and to improve the scheme of prof profit distribution among workers. On the other hand, I would like to highlight that the, the USMCA has been key for strengthening ties with Asia, not only with the US and Canada, also, also with Asia, positioning Mexico as an attractive destination for companies seeking to enter the markets in North America. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, we're gonna. I'm gonna pick a, another question because uh, I'm. I'm trying to uh, have question, economical question, and uh, I. I find this this uh, question in, interesting because it it has to do with uh, the current sanitary uh, context. Uh, so I'm gonna read the Wendy Will Will Ayonto question. Uh, I would like to say that thank you so much for the insightful presentation from uh, all the speakers. I would like to ask Pak Aji Nugrono, how does this pandemic COVID-19 affect the business opportunities between Indonesia and Mexico? And how do both countries manage it? Thank you. Please, uh, Professor uh, Pak Aji, Aji Nugrono, if you feel, if you if you're, uh, want to uh, yes. answer this question. Yes, thank you, Anato, and thank you, um, uh, Wendy. So, um, as I said in the presentation, that actually uh, during uh, last year, uh, when the pandemic is uh, in the peak, um, the trade volume between Indonesia and Mexico um, even increased. Even though it's only 0.1% uh, increase, but um, I think, in my point of view, um, with uh, all disruption, even though it's only a, a small increase, it's a very, very good achievement for, for both countries. As, as we know that um, in general, the international trade at uh, last year was uh, like uh, um, very uh, hard hit by the pandemic. And, 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 and but now the, the problem is uh, mostly regarding the, um, cost of the shipping. Um, as we all know that um, apart from the COVID, um, like early this year, we also have uh, uh, what's called like a block uh, in the um, Suez Canal that it uh, affect the uh, shipment of, of goods in the world. So this is, I think this is the main, the main challenge for, uh, for us. Because like pre previously before uh, the COVID, the price to send a container from Mexico to Indonesia or vice versa, it's just around 2000 uh, US dollar per uh, 40 feet container. But now the price like uh, four times uh, higher or sometimes. So it is, it is very, very, very challenging for us. Uh, but now, um, like last week, uh, we also had a webinar with some of the shipping company in Indonesia. And um, now the shipping company that still trying to find uh, the formula or to use the existing vessels to bring as many as uh, we can uh, containers from, from uh, many regions. So uh, I think that's that's the, the that's my my answer and my point of view in this matter. Thank you, Alonso. Thank you, Aji. Uh, we're gonna follow on our questions. Uh, we still have a little mo more time. I would really like to uh, give voice to all these questions, but I'm afraid that we're gonna have to uh, take a couple of more questions. And one of these questions is uh, from Lintang Amartya. Uh, this uh, she's asking the following. Um, 
So taking Indonesia and Mexico's cultural similarities into account, are there any possibilities for us as scholars and officials to bridge the agenda of grassroots, grassroots social cultural collaboration to each country's cultural practitioners? I presume that such collaboration would serve to, uh, to be helpful to enhance Indonesia, Mexico's political, economic, economic, economic cooperation, and even more so. I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, 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 Mr. Arfani, uh, would you please uh, comment on this, on this uh, question, please? Mr. Arfani, are you there? Okay, uh, if, if somebody has uh, any comment on this, on this uh, question? Yes, if I may. Yes, please, Alice, go ahead. Thank you. Well, uh, I think that it's a very good proposal. Uh, we are open to options considering that culture is not only limited to the work of the embassies. I mean, the more um, cultural stakeholders that will be interested in promoting culture, Mexican culture or Indonesian culture at both in one event, it will be more than, than great, I think. The, the most important thing here is uh, to keep into consideration that uh, we are under uh, a pandemic and that it could be a little bit difficult to make like uh, in-person events, but that doesn't mean that it will be uh, impossible to make like virtual events. What, but what I mean is that, yes, of course, that will help to strengthen the relation to get us closer. And of course, uh, the, the closer we are, the the closer ties we could have in every aspects of the relation Mexico-Indonesia. So if you want, uh, I will put in the chat of Zoom uh, the, the email of the cultural section of this embassy. So if you have any proposal, we are very open. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. I think that will be, uh, that'll be very useful uh, to give our the audience, uh, the embassy contact, or specifically of the cultural sections, because I see a lot of questions regarding culture, which is which is great. I find uh, also very interesting this uh, uh, Mexico-Indonesia relationship uh, through culture. And so I'm going to read a, 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 another question. Uh, so I'm curious. Uh, this is a question from uh, Satria Firhasia. Uh, she is, uh, I'm curious, as it, as it mentions, as it, as it was mentioned previously, that Indonesia and Mexico are working together regarding disaster mitigation. Can this non-traditional security cooperation could extend more towards other security cooperation between two countries, both traditional and non-traditional security issues? Uh, Terry Makasi, so do any of you feel... Uh, Prepared to answer this question? A couple of words. <clears throat> yes, please go ahead, Ambassador. Okay. Okay. Well, <clears throat> for both Mexico and Indonesia, security is not understood merely in terms of, of, of uh, military matters. Uh, security is a multi-dimensional uh, subject, a multi-dimensional matters that includes includes <clears throat> economic security, includes sanitary security, and includes physical security against, against uh, 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 <clears throat> natural disasters, among many others. Well, in all of those uh, subjects and in all of those fields, Mexico and Indonesia are working together. They are working together, for instance, uh, regarding nuclear weapons. They both are trying to eliminate nuclear weapons from the face of the earth because nuclear weapons are one of the worst uh, threats to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the mere existence of the humankind. Uh, <clears throat> Mexico is part of the Treaty of Tlatelolco to ban nuclear weapons, and Indonesia is part of the Treaty of Rarotonga in the South Pacific, uh, and, and ASEAN also has, has, has banned nuclear weapons. And also, both countries are permanently in the, in the, in the, USN, in the USN, uh, UN Security Council trying to find peaceful solutions and not military solutions to, to the problems. Secondly, uh, uh, 
as I mentioned during my presentation, unfortunately, we are two countries very prone to natural disasters. As you, as you know, Mexico has suffered uh, some very, uh, very destructive earthquakes uh, recently, as has also Indonesia, along with some, some tsunamis. Both countries have cooperated mutually during, during, during those events, and both countries are currently negotiating a memorandum of understanding to, to exchange uh, uh, <coughs> our, our know-how and information and, when, and eventually to cooperate during these uh, natural disasters. And finally, uh, the most pressing uh, uh, threat to, to security today is not a military uh, problem or, or, or a natural disaster problem. It is, it is a, a, a sanitary problem. As, as I also mentioned during my presentation, we both are working uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the frame of the, of the UN to make medicines, vaccines, and, and, and the medical equipment available to all countries. Uh, let me to, let me repeat this phrase because we, we we both Mexico and Indonesia are are very much aware that uh, regarding uh, sanitary matters no one is safe until everyone is safe. So we both are working uh, and are taking uh, uh, <coughs> uh, security as a multi-dimensional problem and are addressing uh, the, the problem of security in in a different ways. But that we are doing it together. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I'm going to read a last question, which I think it's uh, quite important uh, because he's a, it has to do with environmentalism. So I'm going to read the question of Valentina Ibarra. Uh, so she's studying at the University of Colima. And uh, the question is the following. Uh, which important environmental efforts are being made or which relevant environmental related subjects are being discussed at the RCEP trading bloc negotiations and inside Indonesia? Thank you. Uh, do our Indonesian partners would have a an answer to this question, please? Well, uh, yeah, Alonso. Well, yes, uh, go ahead, Aziz. Uh, to be honest, regarding the RCEP, uh, I don't know much about the uh, environmental issue inside the, the trading block. But um, regarding Indonesia, I think one of the most uh, um, prominent uh, environmental issue now is uh, regarding the deforestation uh, related to um, uh, what's called uh, bushfire, uh, as well as the um, palm oil plantation, and uh, I think that's that's uh, two of the most the most uh, important environmental is, in, environmental issue in, in Indonesia. And um, but regarding this issue, uh, starting 2011, the Indonesian Ministry of of forestry and environment, uh, they already have a national uh, forestry planning. That it is a, a guidance, a, my, a macro guidance to uh, for a period of twenty years. And this this planning um, in line with uh, the United Nations uh, social, uh, sorry sustainable development goals, uh, especially SDGs number fifteen. So in this case, um, we we uh, the Indonesian government are starting more and more uh, consider forests as not only a source of uh, wood or timbers or and and and, and, and etc. But also forests as the source of uh, energy, water, food, and and, and many more. So. Um, that's that's uh, what I can say uh, for now, Alonso. Thank you very much, Aji. I think we we have reached uh, the time the time limit we ha we had we we've been we've been talking for two hours now. So I, I think it's uh, time to close. So I'm gonna finish by uh, reiterating my appreciation to all the scholars and students of the University Gajamada and the University of Colima as well as to the embassies of Indonesia to Mexico and of Mexico to Indonesia. 
We look forward, as the Embassy of Mexico in Indonesia, we look forward to continuing and enriching our academic dialogue next year. And of course, during uh, these uh, following months. So uh, thank you very much again. And uh, Terry Makasi Banjak uh, to our uh, friends and colleagues that joined this session. I think it's been very enriching and we look forward to keep our dialogue, to keep this dialogue open and alive uh, for the next uh, for the next uh, year. Thank you very much.